Hi, welcome to the Mohua Show. My name is Mohua Chinappa and I am an author, entrepreneur and ex-housewife. This podcast is about everything from business to technology to arts to lifestyle but done and spoken imandari se. Hi, in today's episode we have Sabah Hassan. Sabah Hassan is an award-winning artist with a body of work ranging from paintings, books, sculptures, photographs to videos and sound. She has recently received the 2022 Individual Art Grant from the prestigious Paulo Krasner Foundation New York which aims to advance the work of artists internationally in recognition of their excellence and contribution to contemporary art practice. She has been awarded the National Raza Award for painting 2005 and many international fellowships with an educational background in economics yes you heard me right economics and cultural anthropology saba blends different mediums of art forms to explore the philosophical conceptual and political ramifications of the ideas of truth so welcome saba in today's episode hi thanks for having me here it's a pleasure thank you so much so you know what got me really really interested was this with a background in economics and then getting into art and you speak about your ideas of truth through your work what according to you is truth i mean is there any absolute truth that people are really talking about these days you know the spiritual gyan that's being given out what is truth according to you yes i began exploring the concept uh, over a decade ago when i started working uh, with books as my material and then i recorded a video in which i uh, discussed the notion of truth focusing uh, as you said in the introduction on its uh, philosophical political and uh, ethical aspects but uh, another rather well known work uh, on truth uh, that you can see uh, on uh, sachi art and uh, my website is uh, my nine book installation uh, that comprises as the title uh, prompts uh, of nine books which are wrapped in white cloth and they are placed on rails or book stands and arranged in a very peaceful harmonious uh lattice like geometric pattern with light uh, streaming uh in through a window as if in a sacred space this installation i think uh, best depicts uh, uh, my uh, notion of uh, multiple truths coexisting and eventually leading to the one absolute truth the books are covered so we don't know uh, whose truth it is uh, but like several paths or roads each book each truth will eventually lead you to the same essence i have titled this installation sulekul for the sufi uh, muslim principle of peace for all universal peace to my mind that is the truth seekers ultimate objective This is so amazing, you know. So the way you view art is also through your entire spiritual uh, journey as a person. So is it something that connects to the spiritual world, you know, out of which your art comes out, or of course, obviously, you have a very innate talent, you know, which you've honed. Uh, art and spirituality often go together because without that, you will not be able to go really into your inner depth, you know, to uh, produce any form of art. So. ex you know maybe share with us an experience where you felt very very connected to a certain uh, experience in your life or something that made you look at all of your installations in your work through the spiritual eyes uh, you know of sufism well uh i uh, have uh, looked at uh, the concept and have also used different media in art uh because yes it is spiritual but like for instance in my video which is called haqiqat uh which is uh the urdu or the arabic word for reality so the video is called haqiqat la verite which uh means that uh not only spirituality but reality can also uh equip you to address the concept of truth and here in this video i have centered the discourse around the idea of haqiqat raising uh, real uh, questions you know like for instance how does power determine what truth is it could be political power it could be individual power within a family structure or social uh, traditions 
So uh, do historians, anthropologists, psychologists, do they reveal truths or do they perhaps construct them from their own subjective points of view? So in the video, I speak uh, to experts from several fields. Uh, one was an environmentalist, Dunu Roy. Uh, the other was the writer, Geeta Hariharan, and a linguist, Peggy Mohan. Uh, they discuss uh, the idea of truth from uh, different perspectives, different fields that they come from. So truth uh, is a complex thing, and as is art. Art, uh, I think, uh, for me, primarily is, uh, well, a way of being free. It's about creating uh, your own visionary space, which leads to deeper truths. And these uh, truths, for me, are the essence of human connections with each other, as well as with other living beings, a connection with nature, and of course, the higher spirit, the chi or the force of life. So yes, for me, art is definitely a spiritual search. But it doesn't matter that, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that art will not question or attempt to disrupt power equations, to delve into uh, what I call hatikat, to intervene, to disturb, or even to offer hope within uh, you know, the current living context. Uh, the postmodern uh, theory around this asserts a certain diversity, you know, placing emphasis on identity, race, gender in art. And for those of us who were born into a colonial world, your generation, my generation, these are of great significance because they lead to our empowerment. But as we gain these rights and as we find our voices, we might be able to see that art in the end cuts across all these barriers, all these structural human divides like race or religion. And it strives uh, to uh, embrace things which are less tangible, more universal, you know, like music. I think art is a beautiful, powerful, highly complex uh, uh, lived experience, uh, a felt uh, lifelong practice uh, for us. That is why usually the older artist, I suppose, is perhaps considered to be uh, more seasoned. Yes, I completely agree with you. Jab, uh, you know, aapne jo word istamal ki hai, hakikat ki. So, hakikat jo hai, uske saath hi art ka janam hota hai, you know, because without that, one can't divorce art and uh, the reality that we all live in. But um, coming back to, obviously, there must have been some inspiration from you, from some philosopher or, you know, a personal, a person that you may have met. Um, is there any... Um, reference that really keeps coming back to you you know like for me whenever I sit down and write the people I really strive to would be you know Kemu when you read his book and you you know you realize that there's so much one can look into existential angst and all the oh, other yes. yeah oh, so yes. yeah so there must have been someone who also is always a reminder for you um is there anybody that uh, you know anybody there there's like an army of people throughout yes my of life course and, I'm sure and, you know the, what is the top uh, of the mind recall of a, well, you know, uh, of a philosopher? Well, immediately, if one talks about a uh, uh, painting uh, or what, what you know, people, what uh, everyone thinks of the artist to be, then I think my favorite uh, painter is the Dutch painter Van Gogh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Another who is a little more uh, like me in the sense that she is a multimedia uh, artist is a Cuban-American artist called Anna Mendieta. Now, Van Gogh needs no introduction. Uh, totally. A lot of his uh, life and work has been converted into books and films. Um, uh, in fact, his tragedies have often been, uh, you know, put down uh, and uh, to sort of enhance his work. But that aside, uh, for me, he's not tragic at all, but a very knowledgeable, very compassionate extremely spiritual person. His works are very small in size uh, in contrast to, you know, the spectacle that artworks and installations strive to be today. His paintings are tiny, actually. Uh, but every uh, brushstroke is visible. 
Not one is extra or redundant. And together, they somehow magically, swiftly build up into a very, uh, very powerful, you know, uh, chromatic sort of uh, jewel. I remember during my art residency in Paris, I went to um, a small town uh, called Auvers. It's uh, where Van Gogh died and he's buried. So I went to his uh, grave and uh, to his room, his last uh, room and, uh, you know, that chair that he paints yes. quite often. I saw yeah. all that. And uh, even in uh, the last few months of his life, he was like just furiously, you know, making works and he had very little money. So the size was small. But... Uh, the the passion the 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 connection with uh, you know this uh, with nature with the uh, uh, the compassion uh, in our relationships with each other all that comes across so powerfully in his work that uh, i mean i really find it extremely moving me too and uh, the more uh, you talk and- to me i you know i'm getting the goosebumps <laughs> because uh, you know my father recommended the book lust for life to me yeah. and i was very young at that time because yeah. uh, you know yeah. it's only now the older i grow that you realize that that hmm. search that he had was all the time uh, something yeah. that kept him going you know yes and yes. Uh, you know difficulty is not is is something that we often look at it as a problem but yes. i don't think it's a problem it's always yes. an opportunity for for uh, innate yes. ability inside you to really go out there and yes. yeah and find your entire spiritual connection you know and if absolutely. you're an artist it's one of the best things that can happen to you you absolutely. know absolutely absolutely yes. i totally agree i mean sometimes it it is made out to be so tragic that you would think that there is a, in a way that person is in, incapacitated or something but actually you realize that uh, it's the that entire force of the the person's uh, uh, being and talent uh, can get expressed uh, anyhow. Absolutely. So right now, yeah. you know, with my father being extremely unwell, I'm taking yes. mental notes because, you know, yes. when people yes. really go into their own shell and they don't recognize themselves, this is another journey, right? And yes. as a writer, you know, there's so much that is being exchanged between him and me in our silences. But coming yeah. back to art, you know, do you think India is a mature art market? Because... I, you know, I, and of course, there's abstract art. When you talk to people, they don't understand, you know, and I too find it very difficult to understand abstract art. Um, it seems it's, uh, you know, which the art that's really popular remains in a very conformed space. Do you agree hmm. with that? Hmm. 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 I do, I do, I do. Um, can I just, uh, before we uh, move on, um, taking uh, this from, uh, you know, uh, situations which are difficult and how people and uh, particularly you will find in art history uh, that women have been able to uh, break uh, on through to the other side. So I don't want to just leave it at a Van Gogh. But uh, I would like to mention here uh, a few uh, of my other favorites. As I said, one is Anna Mendieta, but then there are some scholars and philosophers. Uh, one uh, being uh, a woman from Tunisia, you know, most unexpected uh, for most people because uh, they usually associate uh, the West with the knowledge. But she was the founder of the first university in the world. Like a university did not exist before, Fatima al Fahri decided to spend her inheritance and uh, found uh, a, a university and a library in uh, Fez, in Morocco. Uh, I saw this uh, when you were talking about experiences. Oh my God, this is I mean, amazing. Uh, amazing. Yeah, I've been to I, I Morocco went to that and I didn't university. Know. Yes, and you can imagine, I mean, uh, knowledge is a big thing among Muslims and uh, women have always been at the fore. And uh, today there are just so many uh, movements where uh, women uh, and their, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempt to study is uh, being uh, marginalized. But uh, it is a very old tradition among women uh, to uh, study, to found libraries, to collect books, to build universities. 
And so I just wanted to mention uh, Fatima Al Ferry because I'm a huge <laughs> fan of hers. And uh, though she uh, wore a hijab, she really did not conform to uh, what people have as stereotypes. And there have been many women. I mean, even uh, difficult uh, subjects uh, like philosophy, uh, there has been a Greek uh, mathematician called Hypatia. I discovered her actually through a cinema. You know, I saw a Spanish film called Agora. And I came to know about Hypatia, who lived in uh, Alexandria. And she was, a, a, I mean, a very, very successful, well-respected philosopher and mathematician. Uh, at a time when women uh, in uh, Greece and Egypt uh, were, uh, you know, usually kept in the domestic sphere. So, yes, I mean, difficulties can uh, give, uh, in, you know, create uh, very inspiring uh, situations and people. As for the art market, I uh, frankly, at, uh, you know, maybe people will uh, throw stones at me. But yes, India is not mature enough as far as the art market goes. Uh, most artists, especially abstract artists, uh, have to find success outside India before they're recognized here. So uh, with the most uh, art, uh, with people who buy art or look at art here, literal interpretations or uh, mythical references are much more uh, popular and um, our uh, education system is also uh, more uh, rote. It's geared towards uh, very few professions. Uh, we don't inculcate uh, a depth of understanding through teaching liberal arts, uh, dance, design, film, music. This leaves uh, people completely out of touch uh, with their sensitive, humane side. Uh, while life is all about, you know, how much do you earn? What marks did you get? So I think intelligence or aesthetics, if linked to degrees, grades, certificates, I mean, that's a very Indian concept. And it restricts generations of uh, people from, uh, I think, being actually intelligent, curious, creative, imaginative. So, I mean, how can you expect uh, such a population to develop an understanding of art? It's uh, not happening. <laughs> so, Sabha, the more I speak to you, I do realize that, you know, uh, there's so much of depth inside you. Artists are known to be ill-fated in relationships, you know, because they're either so intense or uh, they it will just cut off and, you know, nothing can bring them back sometimes because there's such a, you know, the world of, uh, you know, black and white they live in and there's very less space for grey, you know, um, with artists who are really true to their uh, calling, you know. Do you think it's true? I am really, you know, when I uh, just heard your question and uh, I am really surprised and quite curious as to why you think that uh, artists are any more uh, ill-fated uh, than other people. <laughs> it's just looking back at the history of people and, uh, you know, reading about artists across, uh, you know, generations and, you know, when you're for me, like exactly you spoke about Van Gogh and you talk about, um, you know, Amrita Pritam and uh, so many more people. They've always been searching for something that uh, was probably very difficult to find. And sometimes uh, you think that, uh, you know, a relationship may be able to fill up a certain void. And like we go back to that conversation that difficulty brings out uh, a whole lot of uh, a spectrum within your own uh, work or your body of uh, art. So it's a question that I'm asking. Do you think there's some truth in this? No, I don't think uh, artists, uh, uh, however much uh, we might like the halo around our heads, I don't <laughs> think we are <laughs> any, uh, in any which may, way more special or uh, more damaged or better off or just deeper than other people. I think that uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, you know, they say like a baby chooses its... Uh, I'm of course speaking from my personal experience uh, and the friends I have. Uh, you know, they uh, they say a baby chooses its parents and, uh, well, for uh, free thinking, uh, 
unyielding, rebellious uh, people like you or me. I think we were born to parents who had the bandwidth to deal with those traits. And we have become those parents who have the bandwidth to deal with those traits. And Absolutely. Our children are like that. And uh, I have, I mean, for instance, I lived in boarding schools uh, abroad since the age of six, uh, uh, picking up languages, literature, cinema, you know, just uh, picking up diverse cultures in my stride. And uh, yes, uh, at times uh, I have felt and other artists perhaps have felt uh, a bit uh, of outsiders, uh, but that's 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 a part of uh, I think uh, life uh, when you are looking for independence, when you are looking for freedom of expression, when you uh, you know uh, come across uh, barriers uh, which uh, do not seem to accommodate your vision. Uh, that's okay. I mean, you know, you are, if if you are born with that, then you are born with the strength to deal with it. Oh my God, this is something that's going to stay with me that if you are born <laughs> with that vision and people are around you and you feel lonely, one should learn to live with the vision and take it forward. With the vision. And you know, your central expectations of relationships are in any case what? I mean, love, uh, honesty, uh, loyalty, trust. Integrity. And uh, the rest will naturally follow. I mean, you know, uh, I think uh, we uh, human beings are like Labradors. Totally. <laughs> I have a very hungry Labrador at home. <laughs> He's always hungry, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, fate and destiny, of course. But uh, from experience, I can say that uh, relationships need a lot of nurture. And uh, making allowances, you know, for for your own and other people's vulnerabilities. So, so, so to always expect... Uh, the other to uh, make it happen is uh, not fair, is it? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Absolutely not. It's a, <laughs> yeah, the whole. I think the whole thing in relationships that most you know the so many interviews I've done till now. It's the idea of fairness, you know, because gender also is still needs so yes. much more uh, unlearning, yes. you know, for society, you know, uh, to understand yes. that a woman is an equal individual with equal vulnerability, yes. equal will to live, equal sexual desire, equal wish to express, and. Uh, you know, once that fairness comes in treating one another, I think, you know, uh, relationships will be healthier. Absolutely, you know, mm. and uh, I remember we had uh, spoken about this, uh, how, uh, you know, as many women artists as there are men artists. And uh, I thought this was a very good question because in India, it might seem that there are a lot of successful women, but it uh, does not mean that there is a, not a glass ceiling for us. And uh, it is, it, it, it does take uh, twice the effort, twice the work. And uh, society definitely has, uh, you know, some kind of traditional expectations from us in terms of, you know, uh, how we tackle, uh, we, are, we can go out only if we can tackle the domestic sphere. So, yes, I mean, for women, it is, it is much harder. And, and, and there, there are so many predetermined roles that we have to redefine. Absolutely. Now, coming back to the Polo Krasner grant, uh, what is the criteria to get the grant and, and how do you plan on utilizing this, uh, Sabha? You must tell the listeners among them, there are many artists who would obviously yes, uh, yes, be inspired with your journey. Yes, 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 yes. I was actually, I would actually encourage uh, people to uh, apply for this, especially, uh, you know, at a, a later stage uh, in their careers. Uh, because it's a very generous grant and uh, um, it's uh, essentially uh, given out on a basis of your, uh, uh, the work that you have done, your uh, artistic practice uh, and uh, how uh, committed you are to your work. Um, and uh, all the other selection processes and everything are completely transparent. They are available online uh, at the Paula Krasner Foundation. And uh, I would really, I, I agree with you. I would, I would uh, suggest uh, that uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, apply for this and other grants which are available abroad. You know, they come in uh, quite handy for independent artists uh, like me who want to continue working, but uh, we want to do it unencumbered by the market. You know, sometimes you want to do work which uh, 
may not necessarily be uh, very saleable right now. It will come in handy. Then uh, as far as uh, my own uh, intention is concerned, I, uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy uh, and uh, grateful uh, to the Paula Krasner Foundation that I got this. And I will just continue my work. I'm not uh, expected to do anything uh, different. I will continue my work uh, on my sculptures, um, uh, mixed media paintings, uh, video installations. And uh, uh, now that I have completed uh, 28, 29 uh, years of uh, art practice, I uh, am preparing also for a major publication on uh, my uh, work for this period. Wonderful. And before I end today's podcast, I just want to quote out of a source uh, of uh, from the International Women's Day on gender gap in the art industry. It says, Picasso, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, when one is asked to name great artists through history, these names usually come to our mind. But ask someone to name female artists and the question poses more of a challenge. For centuries, art has been a male-dominated field and even though there's a bigger presence presence of women in art today, opportunities seem to still tilt towards the male peers. So to be able to train as an artist, you make your way in the world as it was very difficult for a woman to be a professional artist, particularly with societal expectations, which continue even today. Uh, it's quoted, uh, this is quoting Kim Jones, curator of the 19th century paintings of the US National Gallery of Art. It says the report that in 2014, Georgia O'Keeffe sold a painting for almost $45 million, setting a record for an artwork by a female artist. But that's hmm. nothing compared to Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which sold in 2017 for $450 million, the highest price ever achieved for artwork sold at auction. Work by Mary Cassatt, a popular painter in the 19th century, also fetches a lot less than a fellow impressionist, uh, Claude Monet at auctions. So yes, there's so much of reality in the gender yes. gap in the art industry. Yes. But with artists like Sabah Hassan, we know <laughs> that we are paving a way forward for Thank you. the next, uh, Thank you. yes, for the next generation of so many girls who are sometimes discouraged from taking on art in their uh, homes. And this is a conversation that will really help them embrace something that they are born to do. Thank you so much, Sava, for being on today's episode. I will be really happy if that happens. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mawa. This has been a pleasure. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services, Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, on all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are The Mohua Show, where we talk Imandari Se.